Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. I have been asked to do methylation again because there are so many people that have talked about methylation and they want to understand a little bit more conceptually about what it is. I've explained in the past that there's really two different camps in the world of methylation. There is the DNA histone methylation and there is the one carbon cycle neurotransmitter methylation model. And both are right. However, there are times and places when you want to use one more than the other and I've found it useful to be able to switch gears and look at one or the other in my practice, especially regarding mental health. With methylation, we want to talk about fundamentally what's happening. The methylation model, the idea is that a methyl group, just a CH3 group, which would be called methane if it were by itself, but it's not methane in the body. We're taking this, this CH3 group and we're adding it to a molecule. And there's many, many molecules that become methylated. Most of the B vitamins become methylated. There are a number of other molecules and neurotransmitter precursors and proteins that are methylated. What it means is you take this molecule, this thing, and, and full, full of a bunch of atoms that are, that are glued together, and you, you add a methyl group on, onto it onto a particular site, and that does several things for the molecule. Number one, it makes it more active. It makes it more able to be transferring through membranes. It's easier for it to go through membranes. Number two, methylation allows a molecule to be grabbed onto by an enzyme. So an enzyme can get a better hold of it. Sometimes it's very difficult for enzymes to grab a hold of a protein or a B vitamin or some other, other molecule, and methylating it makes it easier for the enzymes to grab a hold of it and to transform it into something else. If you can imagine these as Legos or Lincoln Logs or building blocks, an enzyme comes along to a molecule and it needs to grab a hold of it and it needs to take off a chunk and add another chunk to it or break it apart or add big chunks to it. When that happens, that's chemistry. That's essentially uh, organic and inorganic chemistry works the, the same way generally. Methylating a molecule makes it easier for those enzymes to grab a hold of, twist and remove these different pieces from those molecules. The cellular mechanisms inside a cell also require methylation in that when you have a molecule go into a cell, it has to attach to something. It has to be grabbed a hold of and moved somewhere, and it has to be traveling along the microtubules. It has to enter the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. These are structures inside the cell. They're factories, and they grab a hold of raw materials like bricks, and they do stuff to them. They grab a hold of them, and they modify them, and change them, and then and glue them together, and tear them apart, and change their shape, and then they dump them out the other side as a finished product, or as a product that becomes attached to something else that becomes a finished product inside the cell. And that's how we make things like serotonin. That's how we make things like s methionine. That's how we make dopamine. So we have to do all these things and put all these things together and transform them. And the methylation process in the cell, especially the one carbon cycle, makes that easier. How does the methylation cycle work in DNA? Well, much deeper down into the cell, not at the surface of the cell, as I was talking about the surface and the inside of the cell, deeper in the nucleus of the cell, the very core of the cell where the DNA is, the long length of the DNA is wrapped up. It's bound up into histones. And histones are little tennis balls, basically, that the DNA is strand is wrapped like a Velcro around a tennis ball. Methylation allows most of that DNA to be bound, so it does not express itself. And William Walsh likes to say, and I, I really like this idea, that most genes are dangerous. Most genes are problematic. We don't want them to happen. We want them to be off. We want only the very most necessary genes to be open for to be read because genes are just instructions and we want them inside a liver cell or a brain cell or a, or a skin cell. We want the minimum number of genes to be exposed to the universe, to the universe of the inside of the cell for transcription and translation, which is the process of reading the instructions and then baking the cake that the instructions tell you how to bake, which is making a protein, making a hormone, making a neurotransmitter, making a structural protein to make collagen for your foot or, or your joints, whatever it is to repair your gut. So that process requires this methylation, and methylation is what makes the DNA largely sticky, so you don't read much of it. And, and Walsh claims that as you 
methylate and you get enough methylation, you close off the DNA and you have less expression of oncogenes, less expression of things that shouldn't be expressed in that cell. And only the things that should be expressed in that cell and that are truly called for by the environment will make that cell produce those things. So there, there becomes confusion when the opposite of methylation occurs, which is called acetylation. And acetylation is where an acetyl group is attached to these um, DNA molecules and histones, and that unwraps them and allows more of them to be read. And if more of them can be read, more havoc can be made inside the cell and more problems can happen. That's the DNA histone methylation concept. You may have heard of undermethylation and overmethylation. In the old days, we looked at these as histodelia and histopenia, which was the idea that was brought about by Carl uh, Pfeiffer and Abram Hoffer and Linus Pauling before William Walsh, where we looked at the idea that a person could make too much histamine or too little histamine. So histopenia was too little, just like osteopenia or osteoporosis, too little histamine. And histodelia was too much histamine. And that has to do with B cells. B cells are, are white blood cells that make antibodies. And they are part of your immune system and they're involved in the inflammatory process. And they make histamine as an inflammatory response to antigens. This is part of the IgE mediated response, which is the response of classical allergy. A classical allergist and immunologist, if they see histamine and IgE antibodies develop, they'll say, aha, you might have an anaphylactic reaction. You have a true allergy and you might need an EpiPen, for example. That pathway is responsible for the explosion of people needing EpiPens that we didn't see 50 years ago and 100 years ago because people simply didn't have that many allergies. So this explosion of, of histodelia, massive amounts of histamine, are related to our diets. They're related to our stress level. They're related to our antioxidant status. They're related to our macros, which is our proteins, fat, and carbohydrates. And they are related to the toxins in our environments like pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals, GMOs, petroleum-based products that are in our foods as additives, colors, and preservatives. In the process of trying to deal with this, we want to understand that in the old days, we saw overhistamine, meaning histodelia, high histamine, was accompanied by undermethylation. And that makes sense today because most people, if they present, are undermethylated and overhistamined. And there's a small group of people that are the opposite. They have underhistamine, not enough histamine, and overmethylation, and that's a small subgroup that's much less than one-fifth of the rest of the group, and that is a group we'll talk about another time. It's another condition, and it involves mental health problems, and it involves an intolerance to folates and folic acid and, and some other stuff that I'll get into when I do just a class on overmethylation. But most of the time you're gonna be dealing with, most people are going to have undermethylation problem with a too much histamine or histodelia. Those factors go together. And we call that phenomenon kind of a triad. We call it Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a loosening of the ligaments where a person begins to really have super flexible ligaments. It's not the truest genetic Ehlers-Danlos syndrome where you're, you're born with joints that dislocate and you have to be in a wheelchair. It's kind of a adult onset, less severe form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And you can walk and you can move and you can do things, but you do dislocate your joints at some point or truly deeply subluxate your joints at some point from all that excess histamine. The other thing that goes with that triad is mast cell activation syndrome. Mast cell activation syndrome, or MCAS, was really talked about by Dr. Afrin, who wrote A Never Bet Against Occam. It's a wonderful book about the story of mast cell activation syndrome and how he figured this out as an oncologist hematologist who was really quite a sleuth, he was quite a detective in figuring out the idea that you could have this non-cancerous mast cell dysfunction that really resembles a cancer, but it's not a cancer. So these mast cells gone crazy have to do with our lifestyle, our inflammation, and our oxidative stress in today's world, especially filled with antigens that we get from plant lectins and from uh, environmental toxins that we expose ourselves to and from mold. There's many causes. And the third part of the triumvirate, besides Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, mast cell activation syndrome is called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And that's where a person changes elevation. They, they stand up or sit down or lay down or, or sit up and they suddenly have tachycardia. And sometimes the tachycardia comes on a little bit later. It takes a little while for it to ramp up and it stays elevated and it doesn't go back down. A person that, that changes altitude and has a healthy cardiovascular system and a healthy histamine system should sit up or stand up suddenly and their blood pressure might go up a touch and their pulse might go up a touch and then it should come back down to normal. When your, your pulse goes up, we call it orthostatic tachycardia. When your blood pressure goes up, we call it orthostatic hypotension or hypertension. If it goes up, we call it hypertension. And if it goes down, we call it hypotension. 
And that means either you overshot your typical blood pressure or you undershot your typical blood pressure. So all of these things have at their root a problem of methylation. The real root cause of all these people being undermethylated is a high carbohydrate, high processed food, high lectin, high oxidative stress diet. If you can give people a better diet, there will be a lot less people having oxidative stress because they're not eating an ancestral diet. If we could get back to a more ancestral diet of nose to tail animal eating, saturated fats, and get rid of a number of the other things you've already heard me harangue about, we would be able to see a lot less undermethylation patients. We also need to see more nutrients like zinc and minerals and trace minerals, B vitamins, but not so much folates. Folates are a real problem, and we'll talk about that another time. So thank you for listening to methylation uh, as, a, as an explanation of DNA histomethylation and the one carbon cycle.